So now that we've completed the chapter on NP completeness, <clears throat> this is where I think, you know, a lot of complexity theory is going to start picking up. And this is where things get really interesting, where we start looking beyond NP. Before, let me, you know, let's just have a short discussion on P versus NP. So just a few takeaways. This is just going to be a high-level discussion. So many problems, you know, in NP that have resisted polytime algorithms have been proven to be NP complete. And if you remember our last discussion, what we showed was that indeed <coughs> the problem, it's almost like the meta problem of proving theorems with, you know, I'll sort of say that with poly size proofs. And this is actually, this is a, this is a sort of ill posed statement, but you hopefully understand that what I was talking about in the previous, uh, I gave you this language and uh, just to sort of jog your, jog your memory on that. Remember we talked about language L where you have a mathematical theorem that has a proof of length less than T and you kind of pad the input. So you give the input that T, uh, T in unary. And so the problem of proving theorems or with, I should say with, you know, with short proofs maybe is an NP. And so a lot of this says that if P is equal to NP, now this is a bit of a vague statement and you know that one could sort of controversially argue with that, but let me just sort of put this out there. If P is equal to NP, then essentially many optimization problems and these are the kind that we studied in the NP completeness reductions would have efficient and again by efficient I mean polytime polytime algorithms indeed theorem proving which is this problem would potentially be automated. And I should say theorem proving not in the sense of checking whether a proof is correct, but actually discovering a proof, which is really discovering proofs. And so could this be possible? Maybe. We don't know. Although if you ask most people who've thought about these questions, they would likely believe that P is not equal to NP. Because in some sense, the P versus NP question is really saying that checking or verifying a solution is much harder, is much easier than finding a solution. So think of it in terms of SAT. 
checking whether an assignment is satisfying is, is easy. If you believe that P is equal to NP, then you would say just by the virtue of the fact that you can check, you should actually be able to find a solution. And since you that finding is a fundamentally much harder problem. And with P versus NP is really codifying that statement formally. And these are some of the reasons why we believe that P is not equal to NP. Of course, there are naysayers. There are some people who challenge that and say that, well, just because you haven't found a proof or just because, uh, just because there are so many problems that we haven't been able to solve doesn't mean that it's, you know, it doesn't mean that there's some algorithm that exists. Um, but, you know, this is sort of, this is sort of some of the reasoning behind why we believe that P is not equal to NP. Any questions about this before I continue? I have a quick question. Yes. Um, isn't it possible that, you know, even if it is, it, well, it could be P that is equal to NP, but like, you know, these like hard problems, these empty complete problems, just like, you know, like the poly, uh, like the poly time solution is like, you know, like could be like N to like the 1 billion or something. Right, like, so th th this has... Possible? Yeah, no, that's a very valid point. Some people say maybe P is equal to NP, but, you know, SAT has an enter the hundred time algorithm and enter the hundred in no way is actually is efficient by any standard. On the other yeah. hand, asymptotically, what it says is that no, enter the hundred asymptotically is less than two to the N. So it says that there is some structure there that allows you to not search for all solutions. If that makes sense. So the solution space is two to the end, right? That's how many possible proofs there are. That's how many possible satisfying assignments there are. And mathematically, what we're saying is fundamentally, you can get to a much smaller portion of that space. Gotcha. Right? Even if it was n to the hundred. Historically, whenever we found an algorithm in P, we've been able to sort of beat it down and get it to something reasonable. That doesn't mean it'll always happen. There are also some people who say maybe, you know, the fact is, and I'll discuss is there are exponential time algorithms. If you could increase the exponent, maybe that's good enough. So there's a lot of, you know, back and forth on this. Um, but I think, you know, the response to sort of the n to the hundred algorithm is that the point is not the algorithm, but rather the fact that there exists some structure. This is definitely discovering some mathematical structure. And it would be somewhat remarkable if you said that, you know, for proving a theorem, somehow you can just sort of automatically zone in on a much smaller set of possible proofs. So I, I hope that gives a response to this question. Yes, uh, thank you. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Just, just <clears throat> what are your thoughts on P and P <laughs> so, and the relevance of it? My thoughts. So I, you know, I have not thought about, frankly, I've not thought about complexity theory, you know, at any depth to have any comments, have anything, you know, deeper on this. Uh, by now, as a theoretical computer scientist, it's sort of, it's almost like canon, like, you know, one just says, one accepts that and, and move on. A lot of the current focus on algorithms has really been shifted into problems in P and really trying to understand, because in some sense, even an n-cube algorithm is not particularly feasible, depending on you know, your perspective. And so complexity theory by itself is sort of hit a roadblock. And as we'll be discussing, I mean, the P versus NP question literally seems unattainable by current methodology. And um, I don't think that there are actually any, there, there are no, comp compelling techniques to attack the P versus NP problem directly. There have been certain weaker versions of this that have been considered in the literature. And as we go along, I'll maybe talk about some of those. Um, uh, but fundamentally, the problem is that we don't really understand the space of efficient algorithms. And you know, that seems to be the biggest challenge. Like it's very hard to sort of say that there's not gonna be an efficient algorithm. Maybe there's some strange structure out there and what has happened sort of at a meta-mathematical level is that multiple techniques 
have been shown have been proven to not work you know kind of in the sense of i don't want to say that's like girdles incompleteness or something but think of it in that style that literally says that these methods cannot give a proof and some of these barriers are so strong that we really don't know how to overcome these barriers efficiently some people claim that also the problem is sort of ill posed when you fundamentally start diving into it it's you know um it's easier to talk about like a fixed running time like linear or quadratic you know polynomial time itself it's some sort of infinite union of running time classes it ends up being much more challenging to even sort of deal with properly and this is so um i don't have anything intelligent i i don't think i don't expect to see the proof of p versus np in my lifetime because there are far more easier questions that we'll see in this course which are still sort of unattainable uh sort of that's that's my position like i don't it seems like you know where mathematics is really not at the place where we can even imagine a proof of p versus np there have been multiple false alarms over the past few decades and all of them have been shot down to the extent that now i don't think there are really that many people who would actively be thinking about p versus np so on that note let me try to tell you about to go about understanding p versus np what a lot of complexity theorists have done is to define other complexity classes in the hope of shining some light basically on p versus np you know that that's like the that's like the, you know the guiding the guiding light but since then we say okay now we don't know what to do with p versus np maybe we can look at other complexity classes to give us some ideas and so the first most important pl place to look are what are called co classes so these are called complement classes so let's just say c is a complexity c is a class of languages right c is a class of languages then c co c is simply all the complements of languages such that l is in c so for example co np is all languages such that l is in np co languages so for example let's consider the language the complement of sat so that is just the set of all formula i mean okay so let me say something over here and then i'll make it more precise such that phi is either an improper encoding or phi is not satisfiable or now the reason i have this part over here is technically if you look at the complement of the language you're taking now what is sat sat is the language of all encodings of boolean formulas that are satisfiable so let's say you have some sort of wrong encoding then you don't consider it to be in the language you know what is a wrong encoding maybe you know when you convert it to ascii it looks like that like that's what your instance is so suppose phi was this encoding but this is not even a proper formula it's not a proper statement and so that is not part of the language you assume that detecting and encoding is you know is in linear time or is definitely polynomial time because the way the thing is set up so the complement of sat is you know either phi is an improper encoding or phi is not satisfiable conventionally we sort of ignore so conventionally we ignore the improper encoding in defining the co classes so conventionally we sort of ignore this aspect of actually determining the encoding because usually these things are obviously efficient does this point make sense do you understand you know why i have that in there please ask me questions if this is not clear okay 
So I'm going to henceforth ignore this encoding issue. And I'll say the language complement of sat is simply phi says that phi is always false. Right? So phi is some Boolean formula as we've discussed. Okay, just to make sure that we're on the same page, let me ask you a question. Consider the language tautology. So tautology is that phi is always true. Okay, and so now my question is, I'm going to ask you, uh, I'm going to make a bunch of statements and you tell me which one is true. So A is that tautology is an NP, B is tautology is in co-NP, C is neither of these statements are true, and D is that I'm not sure. So let me just launch this poll. So tautology is the language of Boolean formulas that are tautologically true, meaning they're always true. Okay, so tautology is in co-NP. It's basically the same thing as this. All you did was flip false and true, and which you could get by just applying De Morgan's law. Right? So you could just take any formula in SAT, in the in the complement of SAT, and you could just flip you can just apply De Morgan's law, just negate the formula. So tautology is in co-NP. Indeed, tautology is going to be we'll see that tautology is actually co-NP complete. It's in some sense the canonical version, just like you have sat is NP complete, tautology is co-NP complete. So just to give you, just to understand this better, let me give you the certificate definition of a class in co-NP. And you know, you when you understand the certificate definition in NP, You'll also understand this, but just to make it sort of explicit, I'll say that L is in coin P. If there exists a polynomial P and a polytime Turing machine M, I'm assuming that this polynomial is different from this polynomial, right? And I don't want to write everything out in gory detail because, you know, hopefully by now we've sort of seen these such that for all strings x, x, if x is not in the language, then there exists a certificate y of length less than p of x. So there is a polynomial size certificate such that M X Y rejects or accepts. It's both the same thing. Rejects. We can also switch it with accepts. And I'll say if X is an L, just to write it out in gory detail, it just is an if and only if. This is an if and only if. It says for all certificates y of the same length m x y accepts so note that there's an asymmetry here and this is the same asymmetry in np so in np when x is in the language there is a certificate 
that makes it accept and if it's not in the language for all certificates it rejects and here it's just the opposite I can switch reject and accept that really doesn't matter because you can always flip the output of the Turing machine that's not a big deal the point is when it's in the language or rather in this case when it's not in the language there is a certificate and when it's in the language no matter what certificate you give it's going to you know accept or reject we do the opposite of what happens here so is this clear why I can switch the accept and reject questions So this is the certificate definition of CoNP, if CoNP, right? So, and then you can see tautologies in CoNP because when it is not in the language, there's a certificate, which is the, which is the assignment that makes it false. For this language, the certificate is the assignment that makes it true. Right? Because when it is in the language, all certificates make it true and here when it's in the language then for all assignments it's false right so so the key difference is that there is a particular behavior for all certificates when it's in the language but when it's not in the language there is this one certificate that certifies that it's not in the language right so this is this is sort of the key this is the key difference and so <clears throat> let me also define the notion of CoNP complete. So I'll say L is CoNP complete if for all languages L prime in CoNP L prime can be reduced to L and L is in CoNP right so this is like condition condition 1 and this is condition 2 right which is just the same as NP complete so you have this notion of CoNP complete and I've given a claim here which I believe is also in the homework which is that the class of Co and P complete is the same as Co of N P complete. Okay, and this is you know the proof is not very hard, it's basically syntactic. You have to work through the definitions. So co and P complete, co and P complete, that is the complete languages for co and P are the same as the complement of NP complete languages. So tautology is co NP complete because tautology is clearly the is is basically the the complement of SAT. It's essentially the complement of SAT. Okay, up to neg negating, you know, you can negate the entire formula. And that is by this claim is co NP complete. So it's the complete problem for co NP. Any questions about this? Okay. So just to talk a little bit more about this so that, you know, so that we get more clarity. Suppose SAT was in CoNP. Suppose SAT was in CoNP. This means that there exists a polysized certificate that phi is not satisfiable. Let me give another example and then I'll talk through these. Suppose clique 
is in cohen p then when a graph g does not have a size of does not have a clique of size k this is badly phrased on my part let me there is a poly sized certificate sorry this is badly phrased on my part this part should be here what I mean is there is a poly size certificate for a graph that does not have a clique of size k like a checkable certificate right so when a graph has a clique of size k there is a simple certificate which is the clique which cannot fool you right remember always remember certificate has two sides to it when it's a yes it should be able there should be a certificate that convinces you when the answer is no there should be no certificate that can fool you as an efficient machine remember certificates always have two sides right so when it's in Cohen P, what this means is if phi is not satisfiable, there actually exists a polynomial size certificate of that fact, which will not fool you. Similarly, when a graph does not have a clique of size k, there's actually a polynomial size certificate of that fact. Right? So, so it would be pretty amazing if sat and clique were in Cohen P. Indeed, in many instances, where satisfiability is used, you would wish it was in Cohen P. So for example, suppose you wanted to say my code does not have a bug, right? And you apply a SAT solver and the SAT solver tells you, yep, there's no bug. You would like to get a certificate of that fact that there is no bug because no bug is kind of like all assignments have the same value. Whereas when there is a bug, it's easy. It gives you the bug. It says, here's the bug. And you can go and check by yourself that it's a bug. But how do you certify the fact that there is no bug? How do you certify the fact that there is no clique of size k? How do you certify that there is no Hamiltonian path? It's easy to say that if there is a Hamiltonian path, the certificate is, you know, here's the Hamiltonian path. And you can go and check that. And that'll ne you'll never get fooled. But if there is no Hamiltonian path, how do you give a short certificate of that fact? Is this, does this make sense? You know, this, this takes some, you have to think about it carefully, okay? It's like, it's not a lot of language, but it's a very deep concept to try to understand what does it mean to say that SAT is in Cohen P. Questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, is it possible to have a certificate for, for both cases? Like a certificate that tells you if it is in the language and one that tells you that it's not in the, in the language? So, so that's a good question. And... Um, let me give you a simple example where such certificates exist. Okay. Which is, suppose a language is in P. Right? Okay. Then there is essentially, the certificate could be anything, because you can just run your polynomial time machine to determine if it's in the language or not. Okay. Indeed, and you're jumping a little ahead, what you're asking is about classes and what you're asking about languages that are in what are called NP intersection co-NP, which means they have both the properties of NP and the properties of co-NP. I see. So instead of trying to combine the certificates in one, you should think of it as either to try to certify one or the other. And it's, it's a little easier to sort of separate them apart. You can then combine the certificates together and try to do them. You can have two Turing machines that run together, one to certify it's in and one to certify that it's not, if that makes sense. Yes, yes. But sure. And, and, and we're going to see that there's something very interesting in NP intersection co NP. So first, again, just to gauge your understanding, question, is P equal to co P? A is yes, B is no, 
and C is not sure in that we cannot be sure. We don't know about that. Not just that you're not sure, but rather that we're not sure. Just like if you say is P equal to NP, I mean we're not sure. All right. So let me let me pull you on that. Oops. Sorry. Uh, There's a bit, a bit of a mistake. There. Okay. So is P equal to co? So e equals are not contained in, right? Equals and not, yeah, I mean, they're, e they're the same class. My question is, are they the same complexity class? All right. Right, are they the same complexity class? Okay, so there seems to be some confusion on this. The answer is yes. P is equal to co-P. So why is that? Okay, so consider, suppose L is in co-P. Then L prime is in P. So there is a polytime algorithm or Turing machine that decides L prime simply flip the output right so switch accept to reject flip the output of M and this machine decides L. Therefore, that implies that L is in P. Right? Is this clear? Do you see why P is co P? Because if you complement the language in P, it's still in P. Questions? Those of you who, who may have got this question wrong, please ask me. Sorry, I, for some reason I thought you were asking if P is equal to co and P. No, no, no. P is equal to P. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Why doesn't the same argument work with NP? Okay, now here's my question. Why doesn't the same argument of simply flipping the output of a machine work with co-NP or work with NP? Any... Any suggestions? Anyone want to hazard their answer? I was going to say, um, could it be because, you know, uh, with NP, you have non-deterministic Turing machines. Mm -hmm. You can't just flip the, the accepting states like that, right? Exactly. So there are, there are two reasons, and I'll give you both. So one is exactly as said, that there's... If L is in NP, if, if we did the same argument in NP, there is a polynomial time non-deterministic Turing machine, and you can't simply flip the outputs of a non-deterministic Turing machine. The second is if we go via verifiers. So here's the definition of co-NP. 
And we're saying that suppose you apply the same argument, suppose you flip the output. So instead of this being a rejecting, this accepted and this rejected, it still doesn't change that there exists n for all. To get np, you have to flip the x in L being the there exists and the not in L being for the for all. Like you have to flip the if conditions. Flipping the rejecting and accepting over here doesn't really make a difference. Remember, you can take any polynomial time Turing machine and you can simply flip its output and it doesn't really make any difference to its power because this is a deterministic. It's just a standard polynomial time Turing machine. To go from NP to co-NP or from co-NP to NP, you have to keep these and you have to flip the if conditions. You have to flip the if conditions. And that isn't achieved by simply flipping the output. Is this clear? Okay, so I would in general recommend that when you're thinking about NP and co-NP to get used to this, remember there are the two viewpoints, the non-deterministic Turing machine and the certificate viewpoint. And they're both equivalent, but it's useful to keep both of those viewpoints in mind. And you know, try to make any argument through one as well as the other. And then you get more used to, to understanding this notion. Okay. Okay, good. So now let me draw out the common picture. Okay, so actually now that sorry, let's coming back to this is P equal to copy. This leads us to what's called the NP versus co-NP question. And there are some complexity theorists who believe that this is the more fundamental question. I've heard this being said, this is really the more fundamental question than P versus NP, which is really, is NP different from co-NP? Firstly, let me just write a very simple claim here that this is even a harder question than versus P versus NP because if NP is not equal to co-NP, then P is not equal to NP. Why? Why? Because then you have some problem that can be verified in polynomial time, but not verified in polynomial time. So you basically can't decide it in polynomial time. There's a, there's a very crisp answer to this. And it's actually written in the screen. Think contrapositive. Think contrapositive. And so what's the one line proof? Okay, is it the contrapositive of P equals co P, right? So so not co P equals not P and then if uh you know if 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 uh NP does not equal co P, then P cannot equal NP? Exactly. Or more directly, the contrapositive of this says if P is equal to NP, then NP is equal to co NP. That's the contrapositive. And that's just true right here. We just argued that. Oh, right, right. Because if P is equal to NP, then NP would be equal to P, and P would be equal to co P, which we just argued. And co P is the same as co NP. 
So I'll just write that out. It says if p is equal to np, then np would be the same as p, just flipping it around. This is equal to co p. We just argued that above. And this would be the same thing as co np, right? Because p is equal to np, right? So this is why, so if NP is equal to co NP, then P is, NP is not co NP, then P is not equal to NP. Meaning that proving this theorem, if you can prove this, this actually implies P is, P is not equal to NP. So NP not equal to co NP is an even harder problem. On the other hand, there have been many times in mathematics where stating a harder problem is often easier to prove just as when you do induction, sometimes a more difficult induction hypothesis or a more stringent, a stronger induction hypothesis ends up being easier to prove by induction. Because now it seems like this, we can now, you know, you can think about SAT and tautology and say, do there exist small certificates for tautology? And sort of go via that route, right? And this was, this has been attempted and there's, is a whole area of what's called proof complexity, which sort of goes off on this, which is like, do you have short proofs of various statements? The short proof being the certificate. And in a proof complexity, NP versus co-NP is sort of the core question over there. Does this make sense? Do you see? And, I'll make another claim and this this also you should you will be able to see so if an np complete problem np complete language is in co np then np is equal to co-np, okay? So if you take any np-complete language, and if that np-complete language is in co-np, then np will be equal to co-np. Okay, so I want you to think about this, and then we can, we can walk through the proof. This is to get some sort of familiarity with these definitions. So I'll give you a few minutes to think about this. See if you can write down a short proof or just sketch out the proof. It, it's just a few lines. It's again, it's just, it's mostly syntactic. It's mostly syntactic. Okay, does someone want to verbally give me some arguments as to why this is the case?
Well, I would say um, that, um, well, if you have an NP complete language, then any other uh, NP language can be reduced to that NP complete language. Yes. And if you have, if the NP complete language is in co NP, mm -hmm. um, then doesn't that uh, well? Okay, if an NP complete complete language is in co NP, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not sure about this, but I was going to say that NP complete language is also co NP complete. Um. um okay. Um. I don't think that's. Maybe that's going a little bit too far. Uh. Yeah. So you're saying if you have an NP complete language that is in co-NP, then that language is going to be co-NP complete. This statement is true. Okay. But, but I, haven't really proved that I don't think, yeah, there's a sort of, it's not syntactically true, if you know what I mean. Yeah. It's not just like immediately true. You would need to prove it. Indeed, the proof would probably go via the statement. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, then but, I was going to say but, that but, uh, any, you know, then any, NP complete language, NP language will reduce to a co NP language, and then any co NP language will also reduce to an NP complete NP language. But, okay, so but, th there you're yeah. actually right. I mean, you're on the right track. You said that if you have an NP complete language, so let, let, let's give some names, right? So let's say this is L. So any language in NP reduces to L. Right? So any language in NP reduces to a language in Cohen. Right? Any language in NP reduces to a language in Cohen P. So actually you'll get that NP is a subset of Cohen P. Because anything in NP essentially can be solved in Cohen P because you can always do the reduction and then use your Cohen P machine, your Cohen P certificate. Right. So then you get NP is a subset of Cohen P. By complementation, you'll get that co NP is a subset of NP, and therefore NP is equal to co NP. I'll write this down, but that's that's the argument. I see. By the way, this you know this this takes some getting used to. So don't you know? So this is. Challenging. Again, I recommend that you go, you'll have to read through these definitions, try to reprove these statements by yourself without looking, uh, you know, without looking at the, necessarily at the notes. So I'll give the proof, I might just sketch it out. Okay, so L is NP complete. So for all languages M in NP, M reduces to L. Now L is in co NP. So M can be reduced to a Co NP language. Now this implies that M is in Co NP, and I'll just say verify this fact. It's relatively straightforward, but you can see that M is now going to be in Co NP. Because if you wanted to get a certificate for M, you simply do the reduction and then you get the certificate for L. Right? So your reduction, your M machine over here could perform the reduction and then apply the certificate and then check the certificate, right? Because you can fold the reduction into the Turing machine because this is where the closure of polynomials plays a role. So M is in co-NP. What this implies is therefore NP is a subset of co NP, right? Because for every language in NP, you prove that it was actually in co NP. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that for all language, okay, so I, let me not use L, let me use M. So for all M in NP, M 
M is in co N P implying that M complement is in N P. Okay, so just, just to be clear, I'm just saying for all languages in N P, the complement language is also in N P. So now it'll be easy to just argue the opposite. So we'll say, okay, so consider, I'll just use a different one, M prime in co NP. So M prime complement is an NP. That's what co NP means. But by the above, and the above I mean this statement, if a language is an NP, its complement is also an NP. So M prime is also an NP. So M prime is in co NP implies M prime is an NP. So Co NP is a subset of NP. So we have NP is a subset of Co NP. Co NP is a subset of NP. And our proof is done. That would imply that NP is equal to Co NP. Right? So the thing is, this is just sort of syntactically manipulating the fact that you can basically s apply Co over here and apply Co over here. And Co of Co of NP is just NP. Right? The complementation of the complementation is just the same thing. Right? Any questions about this? And you'll see that complexity theory is full of these sort of relationships of implications. Like the, and it's often sort of almost sarcastically referred to as that like if, um, if donkeys can whistle, then pigs can fly. And this is sort of the style of the theorem, that if you have something that's unlikely, then something else unlikely will happen. So you have this sort of relationship between all these unlikely events, although we're not able to show that any of them don't happen. So we're kind of stuck in this morass where we say that, you know, where we get all these implications between various conditions. Any questions about the proof that I've written here? And it's essentially a complete proof, except for this verification that you need to do, which is fairly straightforward. Actually, could you repeat that verification, like, like a sketch of that? This, okay, so, yeah. so what this says is that M can be reduced to a co -NP language. So you want to argue that M is itself in co -NP. So when a language can be reduced to another language, it means that in polynomial time, you can essentially convert instances in M to instances in L. And then you can ask for the certificate for L. Or if you want to think in terms of non-deterministic Turing machines, your non-deterministic Turing machine can first apply a reduction and then run the Turing machine. So you can just fold in the reduction into whatever Turing machine you have. And so you'll have a co -NP machine for this. Or rather, you'll have a non-deterministic Turing machine, you know, with the right properties, if that makes sense. So is that, is that, is that clear? Like what? That helps. Thank you. So I don't know. I mean, um... If you think this would be helpful, I don't mind coming up with like a list of small exercises of this form and just folding that into the next homework. Um, there may be more examples in the book. So these proofs are not complicated. They're just mostly about manipulating the definitions.
right? They don't, they don't require what I would say. They don't require any deep cleverness. You don't come, have to come up with some clever construction, but it requires you to get more um, comfortable with the definitions, which takes some practice. So any, any questions about this? Okay, very good. So now this goes, we, let me draw this picture here. Sort of common pictures drawn in complexity theory so this is NP, and sort of up here is what's called NPC, which is NP complete. NP complete is over there. Here, this is co-NP, and this is co-NP complete. And remember, we said that co-NP complete is the same as co of NP complete problems. So we can just call this. This is like the co-class of that. What we have in here is this. And so the question is, we can say, what is this? And this is NP intersection co-NP. Okay, so what is intersection NP intersection co-NP? It means that there exist Again, sort of polynomial sized poly time verifiable. Remember, a certificate has two sides to it, right? It's not just that if it's in the language, it should certify. If it's not in the language, no certificate should certify. So you think of it as certificate is something that you, you cannot fool a polynomial time procedure. And this is very important. The certificate has two sides. So what does NP intersection co NP mean? There exist poly time, poly sized verifiable certificates. When, you know, X, so let's say L is in co, when X is in L and when X is not null, they may be different certificates, right? So this is maybe a slightly poorly phrased statement on my part, but you can always combine the certificates together. You can just append them one after the other. So it means when it's in the language, you can certify it. When it's not in the language, you can certify it, which seems like a fairly strong property. Now P is an NP intersection co-NP. This is easy to see because P is an NP and P is also in co-NP because co-P is in, you know, P is equal to co P. But NP intersection co NP, and you can ask, is there really anything in here? Like what's going on here? Of course, it could be the case. Remember, we don't know if P is equal to NP, then all of this just looks like P is the same as NP is the same as co NP is the same as NP complete is the same as co NP complete. Right, you, you, it could be this. If P is equal to NP, then all of this code is the same. But if P is not equal to NP, then we get this sort of much richer picture here. And let me now give you an interesting language, which is an NP intersection co NP, but not believed to be an NP. Let me, let's, first, let's first walk through this process. So consider L in NP intersection co NP. If, so what would happen if such a language was, so just give me a second. Okay, what would happen if such a language 
if L is NP complete, suppose L was NP complete, then what would happen? NP would equal co NP. NP would be equal to co NP. The proof is an exercise. You can prove it based on what we've done so far. So if L is NP complete, then the picture looks very different. Then the picture would be like this. It would just be P, and this would be NP equals co NP, and that would be NP complete, which would be the same as co NP complete. So consider a language in NP intersection co NP. If L is NP, if L is NP complete, then that would imply NP is equal to co NP. Now, why I bring this up is because there's a very interesting and very fundamental language, one of much consequence, which lies in NP intersection co NP, and which is not which is not believed to be in P, and this language is called factoring. Okay, so what is factoring? This is really a decision version of the classic problem of factoring an integer. So I'm going to write this down shortly. So given n, which is a natural number, compute the prime factorization. And note that if you can do any factorization, you can just do it recursively to get the prime factorization. What is the size of the representation of n? Okay, there's capital N. How many bits do you need to represent capital N? Nine. Uh, log two, right? Log base two of N. So the size of the input, the size is really log base two of N. So this is the little n. The input size is the log, is the number of bits, right? It's not the number itself. Because you can compute the prime factorization in poly capital N. That's easy. Just go over all possible factors. But you need, you need to do this in polynomial in the size, which is log base 2 of N. So does there exist? Does there exist? a poly log base 2 of n, which is really polynomial, which is poly of the size algorithm for factorization. Right? This is sort of the big question. This is believed to be no. It is believed no, and this is the foundation of modern cryptography, of much of modern cryptography. So some of you, may, you may have heard of the RSA encryption scheme. If, you, if there existed an algorithm for factorization, that would break RSA. RSA, the foundational assumption on RSA is that there doesn't exist a polynomial time factoring algorithm. Again, polynomial in the number of bits, right? So when you have this thing called like 512 or 256 bit RSA, that's the size of the integers that are being used. So it has to be polynomial in the size, not polynomial in capital N, because that would be trivial, right? Okay, does this, does this make sense? Factoring is the problem. Now let's, we do it in terms of a language, right? Because it's an easier to think of yes or no questions. Are there any questions about this? So in factoring, typically we give two. Again, remember, this is the encoding 
and the encoding size is basically going to be log base 2 of n plus k and you'll see that k is smaller than n so it's basically log base 2 of n so it's it's log of this and this says that n has a non-trivial factor less than k and by non-trivial I mean you know one is less not one so factoring is this language if you can decide this language then you can compute the factorization right because you can just do binary search you can do binary search and you can compute a factorization so I'll just sort of write that down I'll say if there is a T of n time algorithm for factoring which is a decision problem then the factorization of n can be performed in T of n times poly n time and the poly n this is just it's pr probably not even poly n it's just linear but this is going to be like a binary search to find to because once you can do the decision you can say okay it has if it doesn't have a non-trivial factor less than k then you know you basically you double the value of k so on and so forth right so is, is, is this clear you just do some you just you can just do this in binary search it's just binary search so we believe that this language doesn't have a polynomial time algorithm the typical way to justify why an algorithm has no polynomial time algorithm is to prove that it's NP complete and you can say okay so why don't we try to prove that factoring is NP complete to give us more confidence in cryptography and the problem or the issue is that factoring is actually an NP intersection co NP and so if it factoring was NP complete then NP would be equal to co NP it's a very common mistaken statement that I've heard you know by people who have some familiarity with complexity theory but not a deeper understanding who will often say oh factoring is NP complete and that is not true because if factoring was NP complete then NP would be equal to co NP which we don't believe to be true we don't think that factoring is NP complete and again I'll, I'll say this again in the end the foundations of modern cryptography need assumptions that are stronger than P not being NP all of the cryptography that we have needs assumptions that are stronger than P not equal to NP you actually need the fact that there is some language in here that's not in P which is much stronger than P not being NP indeed what people want is something even stronger than NP not co NP there's very strong assumptions that you need for cryptography okay let me let, let's now continue with this exercise does that mean when people are like when if P equals NP then cryptography will fail is that like yes misguided uh, I'm sorry is that mis no say that again is that misguided because we need something stronger than P equals NP. Oh, no, no, no. But we need something stronger. So if P is equal to NP, then fa then it breaks. But it is, no, that is consistent. What we're saying that if you prove that P is not equal to NP, that's still not enough for cryptography. Oh, okay. You need something more than P not equal to NP for cryptography. If you actually have P is equal to NP, then that just, part, that just sort of destroys cryptography. But it could be the case that P is not equal to NP and yet we don't have cryptography so actually the, uh, and maybe I'll go over this at some point later in the course um, a complexity theorist Russell Impagliazzo had sort of laid out all possible scenarios and he gave them sort of very pithy names it's sort of like a almost a popular science-ish article 
on the different kinds of worlds that could happen with regard to P and P in cryptography. Um, but sort of coming back to factoring, okay, so factoring, is in NP. And that's actually not too hard to see because the way the language is stated is N has a non-trivial factor less than K. What is the certificate? The certificate is the factor because division is in polynomial time. Right? Division can be done in polynomial time, long division or just do binary search or whatever. Right? So factoring is in NP because the certificate, the certificate is the factor of n that is less than k. Obviously, the factor is polynomial size because, you know, the certificate can be represented in log base 2 n bits because it's just a number and the certificate can be checked can be checked by division which can be done in Poly log base two of n time, right? So you can just divide it and make sure that make sure the factoring is correct. So factoring is an NP. But factoring is also in co NP. This is not as obvious to see. So you can certify that a number has a factor less than k. How do you certify that it does not have a factor less than k? So how do you perform that certification? Suppose I wanted to convince you that this number does not have a factor less than k. How would I do that? Well, in that case, it would be prime, right? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. You could have, I'm just, I'm giving you two numbers, n and k. I'm just saying oh, n oh, right. does not have a factor less than k. And let me also add that checking whether a number is prime can be done in polynomial time. That's a non-trivial result. But let's just say you knew that. Now you know that. So deciding if a number is prime can be done in polynomial time. That's actually a very fun. It's a fundamental theorem that was proven not too long ago, about 15 years ago. But we knew that factoring was in Cohen B before that because there are other proofs. But now that you know that a prime number can be decided in polynomial time, which is very useful, which is what you need, how would you now certify that a number does not have a non trivial factor less than k? Well, could you first run check if the current number is prime? And if it's not prime, then just check the numbers between n and k. But there could be exponentially many numbers with respect to the bits. Right? Remember, you have to do this in right. polynomial in the encoding size. Right, 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 right. And that's the problem. That's why you can't go over all numbers. Would you maybe start by finding the GCD of those two numbers and somehow using that property to reduce the problem? But the thing is, the number k could be co-prime because you're just saying that it doesn't have a factor less than something. Right? I could just give you something that is co-prime. Is there... 
I have one more guess. Mm-hmm. Go um, ahead. Isn't oh, actually, I'm not sure this is work. But I, I, this would work. But I, I was gonna say, isn't there like there's like a sieve of like air toxins or something, right? And that could like tell you all the primes like between the two numbers. But I, I guess like that runs into the same issue of like there being exponentially exactly uh, possible primes, doesn't it? Yes, the sieve of Eratosthenes, uh, uh, the, the sieve also, you know, it basically is exponential. It says that you can yeah. find, you can essentially find a factor in square root of capital N. Okay. Right, but it, but not polynomial in, you know, in log N. Right, right, right. Shit. The answer is already written here. What is it that you need to know about a number? So let's just think, what is it that you need to know about a number to know that it has no factor less than k? What is the smallest factor that a number would have? Uh, two. Okay, potentially. But I'm just saying that for a number in general, can you characterize the smallest factor in some nice way for any number? So can you describe the smallest factor? It's smallest prime factor. Okay, it's smallest prime factor. Right? That would be the smallest factor. So if you can convince me that its smallest prime factor is more than k, then I'd be convinced. Because I can check if a number is prime. Like me being, I'm the verifier, right? I run in polynomial time. So if I can be convinced that the smallest prime factor is more than k, I'd be done. How would you convince me that the smallest prime factor is more than k? Um, could could you uh, maybe just okay uh, af- uh, take find like the next like the two next primes after k. And then if that number, because we're trying to see if there's no numbers that are less than k, no, no, no primes that are less than k, right? If, if you multiply those two numbers together, is the number, is your new number greater than uh, your, your n? You could have numbers, you could have prime numbers less than k, and their product might be less than n. It's just that n doesn't have a prime factor in that regime. Right. Capital right. N. So the certificate is written right here, these three words. The certificate is the prime factorization. For any n, the certificate is, I give you the prime factorization. You can check whether the certificate is valid because you can check whether everything is a prime. You can take the product and make sure you get n. And if all the prime factors are more than k, then you're convinced. I'll write this down, but does that does that make sense? The prime factorization is the certificate. Right? Because you can always check in polynomial time that a prime factorization is the right factorization. The prime factorization is unique. So you know there's only one. You just check if all numbers provided in the prime factorization are prime. You just check if the prime factorization when you multiply it all together, it gives you capital N. Again, that's just multiplication. It can be done in polynomial time. And then you just ensure that all those prime factors are more than K. And that's the certificate. You can never be fooled by the certificate. Does this make sense? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. So I'll write this down here. The certificate... is the encoding of of the prime factorization okay so the encoding has poly log base to n size 
that's an exercise you should verify, right? Because I have to give you the prime factorization. So I have to list out all the prime factors and their exponents. And you can check that all of those are going to be at most log n, and there cannot be too many prime factors, right? Okay, so the encoding is polynomial size. Since primality testing is in polynomial time, this is by no means an obvious result. This is a very deep result. But assuming this is the case, since primality testing is polynomial time and multiplication can be done in polynomial time, the verifier Right, which is the sort of when you have NP, then you have this verifier, or in this case, co NP of the verifier. The verifier can check, the verifier can check if the certificate is a valid factorization, valid prime factorization. And if all prime factors are more than k, then n has no factor less than k. Right? And that gives us the certificate. That gives us the proof. You know, one has to write this out as a proof that factoring is in co-NP. Because now I can certify when n has no factor less than k. I can easily certify when the factor is, when there is a factor less than k. Indeed, if you think about it, the prime factorization is a certificate for both sides. That one prime factorization gives a full cert certification. Okay, is, is, is this clear? So factoring is an NP intersection co-NP. This is a very important fact that you should know. Factoring is an NP intersection co-NP, and factoring is not believed to be NP complete. Okay. And why is it not believed to be an NP complete? As we said, if factoring is NP complete, then NP is equal to co NP, which we don't think is the case. So we would be in somewhat of a strange world where if you thought factoring was not NP, but NP complete, then we would be in this world over here. We would be in this world over here, which we don't think is true. We think actually the world is this. Indeed, if NP is equal to co-NP, that would be amazing. So this is kind of the amazingness when you step back and think about it. If you could prove that factoring was, an NP, was NP complete, then you would actually prove that for satisfiability, there are certificates of not being satisfiable. So you see how these chains are sort of building up into these, in, in these amazing connections, right? So here's the statement about prime numbers. And we're able to relate or about prime factorization about number theory, which is now being related to things in combinatorics. So this says that if factoring was NP complete, then for any graph, if it doesn't have a clique of size K, there would be a small certificate, a polynomial size certificate of that fact. If factoring was NP complete, there would be certificates for set cover, for the complement of set cover, or for the complement of integer programming. Okay, any questions? Any questions about this?
So I'll stop here and I'll just leave the last five minutes for questions. I don't want to start on a new topic at this point. I think we've covered a lot of ground today. So we've discussed co-NP, the NP versus co-NP problem, and one of the most important problems, or probably the most important problem in NP intersection co-NP, which is factoring.